Okay, so we're going to talk now about the next phase of process design, which is specification. Recall the four steps of problem solving. We start with orient, next is plan, execute, and test. And of course, these apply to any kind of problem, not just programming. So last time we talked about requirements, that's the orient phase, and it's basically about what we want to have happen. So now we're ready to talk about specification, which would be how it should happen. And we need a tool to help us do this design and also to communicate our solution. That's going to be the flowchart. Okay, now the big thing about flowcharts is they're a visual technique. They give you a way to show somebody else uh, what your process is and for yourself to lay it out in a visual format so you can analyze it and check it to make sure it does what you really want. Before I get into flowcharts, I want to talk a little bit about the benefit of using visual techniques. And for this, I'm going to use some material adapted from Dan Rome. He has a book and also a website, which I've given you the link to here. And I think it's very interesting stuff. So we, we're going to talk about a how problem. But first, let's consider a couple of others. So what about a when type of problem? Now this is very common. For example, we have a bunch of team leaders, we're working on a big project, and we want to set up a schedule that says when different kinds of interacting activities are going to take place so we can coordinate. Well, for this type of problem, a timeline is the usual way to handle it. And there's a kind of timeline called a Gantt chart that's very useful here. So here's an example of a Gantt chart, and you can see on, on the screen here, we have the different steps of engineering, then the different steps of construction, and it's all laid out so the engineers see their schedule and what they're doing within each time frame, and who's responsible is over here. And then in the last phase, we've already started the construction, and we can see how the different parts of construction overlap too. This is very nice because it lets us establish a schedule and then get some feedback from the contractors and the other people involved to make sure it makes sense. Okay, the next example here uh, shows a Gantt chart with dependencies. So these little, little red lines mean that we have to finish this phase before we start the next phase. So anything connected with a red line to from a blue to a green the blue one has to be finished before we start the green one. And probably some review is involved in there too. So you can see here, there's first there's planning, then product design and development, and process design and development is taking place concurrently. Both of those together then lead into validation. And then there's a feedback and corrective action step, which takes us back to doing another iteration of the design process. This is very realistic. Normally it takes a couple of iterations at least to get all the kinks out and get what we really want. And then once that's finished, finally go into production. Third example, you can tell I like these. I thought this one was cute. Oh, and by the way, I got all these examples off the internet. So this one shows an example of a comic book publisher. And what's interesting about this one is these sort of yellow colored arrows are the nominal, the, the plan, and the red ones are the actual. So the person doing this took their plan and then filled in what actually happened, and they marked here places where the actual was quite different from the plan. So this lets them keep track of what worked and what didn't, maybe go back and either allow more time or, or analyze what went wrong and correct it for next time. Okay, another example is how many, how much. This is a different kind of problem again. People often use bar charts for this. Sometimes they use pie charts. As you know, there's a lot of variations of which many are available in Excel. So here's a, well, what I want to show you is a very clever variation here. This is a word chart of word usage. And basically it takes a speech that John McCain gave. And for each word other than stuff like the and and, which aren't counted, but um, each not, each uncommon word, let us say, they made the size of the word on this chart 
proportional to the amount of times it was used in the speech. And by doing this, you get a really visceral feeling for the tenor of the speech and, and what it was like. Okay, here's another example, and I think a very cogent one, of, of where uh, having a visual technique is so much more informative than just looking at a bunch of numbers in a list, you know, in, in a printout. So this is actually a picture of a woman I, named Robin Mesh that I did some con consulting for. She in, analyzes futures markets, mostly for bonds. And this is her in her office, actually, looking at all these monitors. And she has all kinds of studies on. And basically, what she's looking at is bar charts of prices for things like bonds or commodities or stocks. And her studies are more sophisticated versions of things like these trend lines that you see on this upper right-hand chart here. And the interesting thing that happened was when she first asked me to make these studies for her, I just made a spreadsheet. You know, I took her data and I, I made the formulas and I ran it through and I handed her a spreadsheet and in the last column were the values for her study. And she said, well, this is completely useless to me. I need a visual uh, representation or I, I can't really process it. And so that's what she's looking at here. You can't see it very well, but there's lines overlaying all these bar charts showing her studies. And she's very, very effective at analyzing the market, but only if she has her data presented in the form that she can use, the visual form. Okay, so now I hope you're motivated that we need a visual solution to how we're going to plan our process. And flowcharts are the tool for that, for doing a visual uh, analysis of, of how. So there's no, like, there's no recipe for how to do the flow chart. It's kind of the level of detail and so on is up to you and what works best for you in the current moment on the project you're working on. Flow charts use symbols and arrows to represent steps and choices in doing a process. So first I've laid out the symbols for you. Um, there are arrows that connect different steps. Uh, they're called the flow lines. The big thing about these arrows is they're one-way streets because we're working with time here in a sense. So once you do a step, you move on to the next step, you cannot go back. Okay, and then the different kind of steps. The parallelogram here is going to represent an input-output step. The round corner box is going to be uh, either a begin or end. Square cornered box is a computation step, a straightforward step. And the diagonal is used for decisions. And then we also have a continuation. So I'm going to start demonstrating this with a very simple process, which has no decisions in it. So we always do it the same way. So the flow chart is just a straight line of boxes connected by arrows. And an example would be most recipes, for example, instruction sheets that you get with assemble-it-yourself furniture, simple calculations, that kind of thing. So I'm choosing a simple calculation to do, and it's going to be compound interest. So first of all, here's a formula. If I start with a given number of years, an amount of money, and I'm giving names to each of these. So n is the number of years, p is the amount of money, and the interest rate is r. I want to calculate the total money, I'm going to call that t, that I have after my principal is invested for n years at rate r. And the formula for that, for compound interest, is t equals p times 1 plus r to the power n. Okay, so this goal I've stated here, this is like my orientation phase. I figured out exactly what I want to do. So of course, now part of that is developing the tests, and I've done that here too. So here are my tests. First of all, kind of a normal, well, this, this is sort of normal. I, I have 100 bucks, say, I invested for one year at 5%, I should get $105. Same deal, but seven years, I should get $140. If I put in no money, I should get no money back. If I put in money and I keep it for seven years at no interest, the amount of money should not change. And finally, if I put in some money and take it right back out again without leaving it for the required amount of time, I should get back my original amount of money. 
So you can see here how I tried to cover a couple of normal cases. And of course, I can't cover all the normal cases. What about eight years? What about nine years? Well, I'm pretty confident that if it works for seven years, it's going to work for any reasonable number of years. And then I covered the abnormal cases that I could think about. Just to show you, what if I leave it in for a lot of years? If I leave it for 20 years, I'll get $265. If I leave it for uh, 30 years, I'll get $432. So it really starts to add up. And with simple interest, by contrast, if you leave it for 30 years, you'll only have $250. If the difference is more, like if the interest rate is more, you'll see an even more striking difference. So compound interest is very cool. You should try to get some. Now, how did I get these answers? Obviously, I don't have my spreadsheet done yet. I did them on a calculator. And this is very important. You need to have an independent source of these tests or you won't really know if your spreadsheet is doing the right thing. Now in this process, we're keeping track of some information and I gave names to the various pieces of information like R for the interest rate and for the number of years. Those are the kind of things we call variables. And what it is, it's a name we give to a quantity whose value can change. You can think of it as the name of a container that holds a value. By contrast, there's also content, constants, and those are names for quantities that can't change. A spreadsheet cell is a good metaphor for a variable. It's an example of a place where you can put a value and that value could change. Now, I want to contrast this with mathematical variables because in math, a variable is used to represent some single quantity in an equation. So if we have an equation like 3x equals x plus 6, well, you solve it, right? You subtract x from both sides, and then you divide by 3. And, whoa, two, oh, right, you divide by 2, and you get x equals 3. Okay, so you can check the correctness. If you put 3 in here, this side is 9, and this side is 9, so you know they got, you got the right answer. You would never write an equation like x equals x plus 1. It would be meaningless. It, it doesn't have a solution. In programming, though, variables are different. In programming, we're using a variable to represent a location where we can store value. So if I write x equals 4 in a program, it means to store the value 4 in location x. It's not a statement of fact. It's an instruction to do something. So I could write a pair of assignments. First write x equals 4, which means put the value 4 into location x. And then I actually can write x equals x plus 1. And what it means is take the value that's in x, which is 4, add 1, and I get 5, and now store that back into x. So x is now changed from 4 to 5. And this is perfectly legitimate in terms of programming. So here's the flow chart for my compound interest calculator. So I'm starting with a round corner box for begin. Then I have a parallelogram showing my input, and here I did it by showing how I'm assigning different values to these variables. Here's my formula in the square box, square corner box, where I do my computation. Then I output the total, and that's the end. Now I have a spreadsheet called Interest Calculator 1 on the site, and it has this formula in it. So I'm going to stop now and uh, we'll resume with a different video.